Last time we began a scenario where Gohan and Trunks won, defeating the androids in a very tough fought battle. Although there are some other changes they've encountered, so where do we go from here? We'll explore all that and more in the second part of what if Gohan and Trunks save the future. The androids are gone for good, they still can't believe it. Although there is one downside to this, the time machine is gone. Which isn't necessarily too big of an issue, Bulma thinks it's fine. The androids are gone so they're safe, there's no reason to use a time machine anymore. She could work on another one, but she doesn't see a point. The whole point was to stop this from ever happening. And yes, without traveling back in time, they can't revive their friends. But she also considers the risk of going back in time. When they're already victorious here, why risk losing that? What if going back in time somehow doesn't work and just makes things worse? There's a chance they can make it better, but they're not desperate here. The androids are gone. All they'd be time traveling for is just to get Goku and everyone else back. But they could screw up other things in the process. Trunks then brings up Namek. Didn't they tell him stories about some planet they went to a while ago where they got Dragon Balls? You know, that one place where Piccolo's from. Can't they just go there and get Dragon Balls and revive everybody? Or at the very least, bring the Dragon Balls back here. That would be a good idea, but there's kind of an issue here. They don't know where Namek is. They can't find new Namek on their own. Plus, in Ken and King Kai never did help them find it for some reason. So it's safe to assume that they're not going to get any help finding it here. Maybe if they were going to the original Namek, that would be fine, but that planet's gone. Without directions, or Goku being able to teleport there, they're not going to be able to get there. But they should be happy that they're at least victorious. Sure, they've lost some of their friends. A lot of people have died to the androids too. But at least those sacrifices weren't in vain. Gohan and Trunks were able to live on and eventually save the future. Or I guess not the future here because there's no other timeline. It's just this timeline. They saved the world. But even though everyone else is dead, they're in another world. They're still living on in some aspect. So what's going on there? King Kai is with all the Earthlings and Goku in other world. Vegeta's a notable exception here because given the time of his death, he probably did go to hell unfortunately. Goku does hope to see him eventually though. But it kind of makes sense that he wasn't sent here. All this time they've been able to keep their bodies and been able to train here. It's been great. And not just because of that, but Goku could see all of his friends up here. He's sad to have left people like Gohan, Chi Chi, and Bulma behind. But he knows Earth is in good hands and he hears that Gohan and Trunks were actually able to win there. He knew they had it in him. Goku's proud of the fact that Gohan was able to do this. He'd like to visit Earth again someday, but this time is limited. If he goes back, he only has one 24-hour period where he can go to Baba. He's going to use it very wisely. Although, he is very tempted to just teleport to Earth, even though he knows that's strictly prohibited. But now he's here training to his heart's content, spending all of his time with his friends, and even some of his family because Grandpa Gohan's there. Of course, after all this time, he's met up with him. It's bittersweet. He had to leave Earth behind, but he brought a piece of it with him his best friend, some of his rivals, and his grandpa. Of course, there are still some people alive on Earth. Roshi, Oolong, and Puar are alive, and now they can finally come out of hiding, which is great. Now the focus is rebuilding everything the androids destroyed. Bulma doesn't focus on a time machine anymore either. It's going to take too much work, and again, there's all the risk involved, so they're going to leave that be here. Of course, all the while, Gohan and Trunks continue to grow, especially with this period of peace, they can make great use of this, and grow a lot stronger so in case there are any other threats that will show up, they'll be more than prepared. Gohan reminds Trunks, they're not only the first line of defense for Earth, but the only line of defense. Against the androids, it was harder to train. They had limited resources and limited time, and they had to keep a low profile. But he's going to make great use of this peacetime he bought. He's been a great teacher to Trunks, and he wants Trunks to grow even further. Plus, he knows this is something Goku would have wanted. It's so weird, ever since the androids were defeated, it's so weird to him because ever since the androids were defeated, it felt like Goku was just smiling down upon him, telling him this is the right direction to go. He can't really explain why, but he just feels that. Of course, he does also want to pursue his dream of becoming a scholar. Now that Earth is finally at peace, and he's not spending all of his time just surviving, he could do other things besides fighting. Of course, he still has his family too. Ox King and Chi Chi are still there. Plus, he's grown a lot closer with Bulma and Trunks, with Trunks being like a brother to him. Not all is lost. And maybe he could live somewhat of a normal life now, even though so much of it was taken away by the androids. But strangely enough, Gohan finds out later on that someone else survived that he didn't even know about before. Yajirobe's alive. He was hiding before, but now he finds Bulma. Since the androids are defeated, he has no need to hide and he explains how he survived. He's also surprised to see Gohan's appearance. It's a shame he didn't have any Senzu because otherwise he could have grown his arm back, but by now it's healed over. Too bad Korin didn't have any left over. And Gohan asks if he knows anything about growing it, because it seems like he does have some knowledge of it at least. Well, he can't work miracles, but he can at least show them what Korin has left behind. Not that there's much left. There's not going to be any Senzu beans either, and the plant's gone. But why do they need the Senzu? Earth is saved. Well, they never know when they're going to need that again. Plus, it can really help with training. So even though it's a long shot, it is worth looking into. Bulma chimes in too. Maybe she could even help. Who knows? Depending on what she has to work with, she could probably even reverse engineer a Senzu plant. So even though it's not going to be the real thing, especially with the fact that she could work normally again, she might be able to create something from it. Yajirobe leads Gohan and Trunks to Korin's tower. And they get some info on the Senzu plant and whatever remains of it. At least Korin left something behind. But Gohan asks him what's on top of the tower. He feels like he remembers his dad telling him something about this a while ago. Up top is Kami's lookout, but there's nothing up there now. Korin's tower and the lookout are partially destroyed. 
and Super Future Yajirobe explains that the androids attacked them somehow, which led to Korin dying and how he sacrificed himself. So that means they probably did end up finding the lookout. He doesn't necessarily know if anything's up there because he hasn't been up there, but Gohan and Trunks decide to fly up just to see. The place is somewhat damaged, but it looks like the androids didn't care to attack here. Gohan guesses that they saw no one up here and decided they were bored, so they went back down to the surface. But the second they get up there, someone else makes their presence known, sensing that there's allies here and there's no need to hide. It's Mr. Popo. There's no confirmation that Mr. Popo actually died in the future. He might have died amidst the android's attack, but if Yajirobe were able to survive somehow, Mr. Popo would probably find a way to as well. Of course, he knows Yajirobe and he's glad to see him alive, but as for the other two, he doesn't even recognize them at first. Last time he heard about them was when Kami was still alive. But seeing Gohan's outfit, he's able to tell. This is Goku's son. And the other one, that should be Bulma and Vegeta's son. At least from when he last heard about them. He's glad to see that they're alive. Especially Gohan. He knows everyone else is gone, but this is the closest thing to Goku coming back for him. Ever since Kami died, he waited up here. There was a point where the androids attack, but since he knew the lookout's layout, he was able to hide pretty easily, and the androids couldn't sense him. From what he remembers, they attacked here, and then got bored really quickly because no one was up here. Korin, unfortunately, wasn't able to survive. The lookout was in worse shape before, too, but Popo spent some time fixing it up, although he couldn't really do too much because he was worried that the androids would come back, so he didn't want to go outside as much. But now the androids are gone, so there's no need to worry about that. They also do learn of the Room of Spirit in Time, which could be helpful in the future. That actually would have been really helpful beforehand, too. But they had no clue about it, the lookout's location, nor the means to go and find the lookout because they could have been spotted by the androids. But at least now they found some other survivors. Bulma also takes the info they have and tries to rework the Senzu plan. It takes some time, but she kind of reverse engineers it, and it doesn't seem as effective at first, but she's going to keep working on it. This is really helpful for Gohan and Trunks' training. And they try and use it just to see if they could bring Gohan's arm back, but right now it's long healed over, so there's no chance. It was at least worth a shot, though, and now they have something to heal with later on. A couple of years pass. Cities are rebuilt and society slowly turns back to normal. Gohan and Trunks keep up with their training, but also their personal lives improve. Trunks even ends up getting a job at Capsule Corp, given the fact that now it and Bulma are active again. As for Gohan, he does go back to his studies, trying to catch up on what he's missed. He's always wanted to become a scholar, and now is the chance. It is a weird situation, though, given how much school he's missed, and the fact that so much was destroyed and at risk that no one really went to school in the first place, at least in the areas affected by the androids. And as Gohan feared, another threat eventually does show up. One day there's a newscast, and one of the cities nearby, a bunch of people have mysteriously disappeared, with nothing but their clothes being left behind. Worried about this, Gohan immediately heads out, and thankfully it's perfect timing because whoever did this, their power isn't suppressed right now. But their power feels really strange. He feels the key of his friends, people who have died. He feels Frieza's key, and strangest of all, he feels Goku's key. At first, he doesn't know what to think feeling all these key signatures together. But he's quickly able to recollect himself and realize that this isn't what it seems. This is some sort of threat, especially with the fact that Frieza's key is part of it. Thankfully, he's fast enough to get there before whoever did this escaped. And he sees some sort of green creature standing in front of him. Trunks arrives not too long after. What is this thing? Is it some sort of alien? That doesn't make sense though, why does it have everyone's key? Cell didn't want to get spotted this early, but it looks like he doesn't have much of a choice. Granted, these are the only two people he needs to fight anyways, the two biggest obstacles here on Earth. Once he kills them, he's free to do whatever he wants. Cell is purely focused on killing them, and has no other objective now that Goku's gone. Well, besides becoming perfect, which is kind of impossible now that the androids are dead. But he'll figure out something here. Of course, he doesn't reveal who he is or what he's here for. And Gohan and Trunks don't exchange much words with him. They just get ready to fight. Although they do want to find out who he is because they want to figure out where this threat came from. They are able to get one piece of info out of him though. Dr. Duro created him. Okay, that tells them all they need to know. Looks like there was one other android left that they didn't know about. And Gohan asks Trunks if he wants to take this. This would be a great way to show off his training. By now he thinks Trunks is more than strong enough to actually handle this. Not to mention, Cell doesn't seem necessarily too powerful here. Once he fully powers up, Gohan's confident that they'll be able to win here. But he doesn't show that on his face because he doesn't want Cell to escape. First, they have to make Cell feel confident so he stays here and fights. And then, that's when they strike, and Gohan will bring out his full power to kill him. Trunks powers up into Super Saiyan. Gohan's hoping that soon enough he'll be able to use that other thing they got. But for now, Trunks is still working towards that. At least he has perfect control over Super Saiyan. And he uses this to fight against Cell. Cell's having a really tough time against him. They learn that Cell knows everybody else's techniques, and he can regenerate too. If he draws this fight out long enough, he might actually be able to defeat Trunks. But he doesn't realize how long they've been training for. It's been years after all. And thanks to Bulma's help with the Senzu plant, at least the artificial one, they've been able to do much more intense training. They haven't used the time chamber yet, but that's also an option if they needed. Trunks is using Super Saiyan Grade 4 at the moment, and Gohan's hoping this is enough for him to tap into his anger to unlock that other thing they were working on. Gohan has this himself, but Trunks still needs that extra push, which he doesn't blame Trunks for, but this is a good opportunity. Seeing another android, it should allow Trunks to tap into that anger. Of course, Gohan's not going to be too reckless here. Trunks does want to fight. 
Trunks really wants to prove himself, especially because Gohan did a lot of the work against the androids before. And Gohan knows that if Trunks is having any sort of trouble, he could jump in immediately and stop this. Trunks is doing pretty well against Cell, too. From what Gohan could tell, Trunks actually does overpower Cell somewhat, but not to a massive extent. It's enough that Cell's able to keep up due to his skill and his abilities, thanks to having so much more to work with. But he notices something, a change within Trunks. Trunks is thinking about everything that happened before. He felt useless against the androids, at least up until a certain point. He's not going to be a burden anymore. He doesn't want Gohan to have to fight all his fights for him. He needs to be able to fight on his own. If he can't kill this enemy in front of him, this other android, what sort of progress has he made? And for a brief moment, Trunks powers up. His aura changes, and Gohan can tell that he's done. Even though it was only for a few seconds, Gohan can see that Trunks has tapped into Super Saiyan 2. At least, that's what he's calling it. He doesn't actually know what this form is, but that sounds like a fitting name. With this power up, Trunks finishes set, seemingly destroying every little bit of it. He then powers down, glad that he was able to win that fight. And Gohan's really proud of him. He's getting a lot closer to actually using that form fully. This is just like when he first learned Super Saiyan. Now he knows the feeling of Super Saiyan 2, and he just needs to tap into that again somehow, and then master it. The two get ready to leave, but they stop in their tracks. Gohan then quickly powers up to his maximum, going Super Saiyan 2. He turns around and slaps an attack away, a death beat, aimed at Trunks. Cell is there looking worn out, but he's regenerated fully. It seems his regeneration is way stronger than they realized, and Gohan kind of laughs it off. Piccolo gave that guy this regeneration. Even from the afterlife, Piccolo's still throwing him curveballs. Trunks wants to fight, but Gohan says he's done well enough. He'll handle this. He vanishes, and faster than Cell can react, Gohan appears right underneath him. Within an instant, he's swallowed up by a Kamehameha, destroying every single bit of him. Even in death, Piccolo is still trying to keep him on his toes. Of course, this isn't the last threat they'll encounter. Someone's observed their fight with Cell. It's Bobbity. He's a little bit angry because he was keeping a close watch on Cell for a reason. He was going to use that guy to gather energy. Bobbity was going to try and possess him somehow, but didn't really know how to go about it yet. Plus, they're not necessarily set up here fully. He was going to wait a little longer, but now it stinks because he can't use Cell as a minion. Oh well, Boo would be revived soon enough. But that's not the only thing changing in the universe. On the sacred world of Kai, Shin feels something strange. And it's not Bobbity on Earth, or anything on Earth for that matter. After all this time, Beerus has finally woken up again. Why now though? With that, we'll leave off here for now. What'd you guys think about this part? And what's going to happen next? Leave your thoughts and ideas in the comments below. I'd love to see what you think. As usual, be sure to drop a like and subscribe if you haven't already. It really does help out the channel and shows me you want to see more videos like this. Anyways, thank you all for watching, and I'll see you all in my next video.